Welcome back, Mitchell Mustangs. Thank you for watching another video this Wednesday, April 15th. Wow, yesterday, the chapter, that was the climax of the story. Everything that's been important led up to the moment where Wilbur received that very, very special award. And I just loved the whole chapter. I love how E.B. White crafted the chapter to make it exciting to read, to have Wilbur pass out at one point and Templeton actually help him out. That was pretty interesting. And Avery at the end to be a clown and, and get to see him as well. I thought it was really interesting how Fern went off with Henry Fussy. So remember, we talked about that chapter, Dr. Dorian, when the mom went and visited this doctor and said, I'm so worried about my child hanging out with animals. And that chapter does not necessarily have to be inside of the book. However, I'm seeing its value now, its importance, because Fern is changing. Fern's growing up and she's a little more interested in hanging out with friends than hanging out with the animals. I found that really interesting. So now we're at a point that great readers really appreciate a resolution that's done well. And the resolution comes after the climax. It's the author's chance to tie together all the pieces and bring everything to a close. So that's why I'm thinking about those things. I'm, I'm now wondering, so Charlotte has been quiet and has seemed a little distant. And I'm so curious to know why is that? And I'm wondering as they return back to the barn, will it be different now? And what will take place when they all come back together with Wilbur and Charlotte? And will Fern still hang out at the barn? I'm wondering if she's gonna be spending more time with her friends. So these are all pieces that I am so curious to find out how is E.B. White going to tie it all together. And when an author does a resolution well, it is so satisfying for the reader. So let's read. I can't wait to see what's going to happen in today's chapter. Last day. Charlotte and Wilbur were alone. The families had gone to look for Fern. Templeton was asleep. Wilbur lay resting after the excitement and strain of the ceremony. His medal still hung from his neck. By looking out of the corner of his eye, he could see it. Charlotte, said Wilbur after a while, why are you so quiet? I like to sit still, she said. I've always been rather quiet. Yes, but you seem specially quiet today. Do you feel all right? A little tired, perhaps, but I feel peaceful. Your success in the ring this morning was, to a small degree, my success. Your future is assured. You will live secure and safe, Wilbur. Nothing can harm you now. These autumn days will shorten and grow cold. The leaves will shake loose from the trees and fall. Christmas will come, then the snows of winter. You will live to enjoy the beauty of the frozen world. For you mean a great deal to Zuckerman, and he will not harm you ever. Winter will pass. The days will lengthen. The ice will melt in the pasture pond. The song sparrow will return and sing. The frogs will awake. The warm wind will blow again. All these sights and sounds and smells will be yours to enjoy. Wilbur, this lovely world, these precious days, Charlotte stopped. A moment later, a tear came to Wilbur's eye. Oh, Charlotte, he said to think that when I first met you, I thought you were cruel and bloodthirsty. When he recovered from his emotion, he spoke again. Why did you do all this for me? He asked. I don't deserve it. I've never done anything for you. You have been my friend, replied Charlotte. 
That in itself is a tremendous thing. I wove my webs for you because I liked you. After all, what's a life anyway? We're born, we live a little while, we die. A spider's life can't help being something of a mess with all these trappings and eating flies. By helping you, perhaps I was trying to lift up my own life a trifle. Heaven knows anyone's life can stand a little of that. Well, said Wilbur, I'm no good at making speeches. I haven't got your gift for words, but you have saved my life, Charlotte, and I would gladly give you my life. I really would. I'm sure you would. And thank you for your generous sentiments. Charlotte, said Wilbur, we're all going home today. The fair is almost over. Won't it be wonderful to be back in the barn cellar again with the sheep and the geese? Aren't you anxious to get home? For a moment, Charlotte said nothing. Then she spoke in a low voice, so low Wilbur could hardly hear the words. I will not be going back to the barn, she said. Wilbur leapt to his feet. Not going back, he cried. Charlotte, what are you talking about? I'm done for, she replied. In a day or two, I'll be dead. I haven't even strength enough to climb down into the crate. I doubt if I have enough silk in my spinnerets to lower me to the ground. Hearing this, Wilbur threw himself down in an agony of pain and sorrow. Great sobs racked his body. He heaved and grunted with desolation. Charlotte, he moaned. Charlotte, my true friend. Come now, let's not make a scene, said the spider. Be quiet, Wilbur. Stop thrashing around. But I can't stand it, shouted Wilbur. I won't leave you here alone to die. If you're going to stay here, I shall stay too. Don't be ridiculous, said Charlotte. You can't stay here. Zuckerman and Lurvy and John Arable and the others will be back any minute now, and they'll shove you into that crate, and away you will go. Besides, it wouldn't make any sense for you to stay. There will be no one here to feed you. The fairgrounds will soon be empty and deserted. Wilbur was still in a panic. He raced around and round the pen. Suddenly he had an idea. He thought of the egg sack and the 514 little spiders that would hatch in the spring. If Charlotte herself was unable to go home to the barn, at least he must take her children along. Wilbur rushed to the front of his pen. He put his front feet on the top board and gazed around. In the distance, he saw the Arables and the Zuckermans approaching. He knew he had to act quickly. Where's Templeton? He demanded. He's in that corner under the straw asleep, said Charlotte. Wilbur rushed over, pushed his strong snout under the route and tossed him in the air. Templeton, screamed Wilbur, pay attention. The rat, surprised, out of a sound sleep, looked first dazed, then disgusted. What kind of monkey shine is this? He growled. Can't a rat catch a wink asleep without being rudely popped into the air? Listen to me, cried Wilbur. Charlotte is very ill. She has only a short time to live. She cannot accompany us home because of her condition. Therefore, it is absolutely necessary that I take her egg sack with me. I can't reach it and I can't climb. You are the only one that can get it. There's not a second to be lost. The people are coming. They'll be here in no time. Please, 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 Templeton, climb up and get that egg sack. The rat yawned. He straightened his whiskers. Then he looked up at the egg sack. So, he said in disgust, so it's old Templeton to the rescue again, is it? Templeton, do this. Templeton, do that. Templeton, please run down to the dump and get me a magazine clipping. Templeton, please lend a piece of string so I can spin a web. Oh, hurry, said Wilbur. Hurry up, Templeton. But the rat was in no hurry. 
he began imitating Wilbur's voice. So it's hurry up, Templeton, is it? He said, ho, ho, and what thanks do I ever get for these services? I would like to know. Never a kind word for old Templeton, only abuse and wisecracks and side remarks. Never a kind word for a rat. Templeton, Wilbur said in desperation. If you don't stop talking and get busy, all will be lost, and I will die of a broken heart. Please climb up. Templeton lay back in the straw lazily. He placed his forepaws behind his head and crossed his knees in an attitude of complete relaxation. Die of a broken heart, he mimicked. How touching, my, my, I notice that it's always me you come to when in trouble, but I've never heard of anyone's heart breaking on my account. Oh no, who cares anything about old Templeton? Get up, screamed Wilbur. Stop acting like a spoiled child. Templeton grinned and lay still. Who made trip after trip to the dump, he asked. Why, it was old Templeton. Who saved Charlotte's life by scaring that arable boy away with a rotten, rotten goose egg? Bless my soul, I believe it was old Templeton. Who bit your tail and got you back on your feet this morning after you had fainted in front of the whole crowd? Old Templeton. Has it ever occurred to you that I'm sick of running errands and doing favors? What do you think I am anyway, a rat of all works? Wilbur was desperate. The people were coming and the rat was failing him suddenly. He remembered Templeton's fondness of food. Templeton, he said, I will make you a solemn promise. Get Charlotte's egg sack for me, and from now on, I will let you eat first when Lurie slots me. I will let you have your choice of everything in the trough, and I won't touch a thing until you're through. The rat sat up. You mean that? He said. I promise, cross my heart. All right, it's a deal, said the rat. He walked to the wall and started to climb. His stomach was still swollen from last night's gorge. Groaning and complaining, he pulled himself slowly to the ceiling. He crept along till he reached the egg sack. Charlotte moved aside for him. She was dying. But she still had strength enough to move a little. Then Templeton bared his long, ugly teeth and began snipping the threads that fastened the snack to, sack to the ceiling. Wilbur watched from below. Use extreme care, he said. I don't want a single one of those eggs harmed. This, this, in my mouth, complained the rat. It was the caramel candy. But Templeton worked away at the job and managed to cut the sack adrift and carry it to the ground, where he dropped it in front of Wilbur. Wilbur heaved a great sigh of relief. Thank you, Templeton, he said. I will never forget this as long as I live. Neither will I, said the rat, picking his teeth. I feel as though I've eaten a spool of thread. Well, home we go. Templeton crept into the crate and buried himself in the straw. He got out of sight just in time. Lurvy and John Arable and Mr. Zuckerman came along at that moment, followed by Mrs. Arable and Mrs. Zuckerman and Avery and Fern. Wilbur had already decided how he would carry the egg sack. There was only one way possible. He carefully took the little bundle in his mouth and held it there on top of his tongue. He remembered what Charlotte had told him, that the sack was waterproof and strong. It felt funny on his tongue and made him drool a bit. And of course, he couldn't say anything. But as he was being shoved into the crate, he looked up at Charlotte and gave her a wink. She knew he was saying goodbye in the only way he could, and she knew her children were safe. Goodbye, she whispered. Then she summoned all her strength and waved one of her front legs at him. She never moved again. Next day, as the Ferris wheel was being taken apart, and the racehorses were being loaded into the vans. 
and the entertainers were packing up their belongings and driving away in their trailers, Charlotte died. The fair, oh, it's so sad. The fairgrounds were soon deserted. The sheds and buildings were empty and forlorn. The infield was littered with bottles and trash. Nobody of the hundreds of people that had visited the fair knew that a gray spider had played the most important part of all. No one was with her when she died. Oh, Mitchell Mustang. Ah, I'm just going to leave you with that, the resolution to think about how E.B. White brought everything together for us, how he so beautifully showed their friendship, how he resolved the issues that were taking place with Charlotte and we found out what was happening to her. So I'll leave you on that. We'll meet again tomorrow to finish the book, continue along with the resolution, seeing how everything is tied together. It really is satisfying when an author does it so beautifully. So the last thing I will say to you today, sweet Mitchell Mustangs, is stay healthy, happy reading, and happy writing.